brief comment before this episode of Inspired by Yarra gets underway. And that is to note that this conversation that you're about to listen to was recorded well before COVID-19 was impacting life as we know it. We believe that this content is still relevant and helpful and we do want to acknowledge the current challenge that we're all facing. And thus, we invite you to share this or any other episode of Inspired by Yarra from our extensive library with the people who you think that it could help. Take care out there. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. This is a podcast that we've created to help tell the stories, the stories that are part of our history, the very fabric of our foundations. And today, We are going way back, way back to the class of 1975, where I'm going to sit down with Professor David Jamison, who graduated Year 12 in 1975 from here at Yarra Valley Grammar. He is a published author and authored hundreds and hundreds of papers in science journals that are read across the world. He's a fascinating character. He's motivation and inspiration for all things physics and his passion for it comes out as we have a conversation that begins here at school and some of the co-curricular activities that he was part of and the leadership that he showed and then it has taken him around the world and that's where we're going to go in our conversation today. I'm delighted here today to present to you another conversation with a Yog, a Yarra Old Grammarian. And I know that if you stick with it, you're going to listen and enjoy this conversation with David Jamison from the class of 1975. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about what was it like in those early days as a year seven student. Enjoy. Uh, I, I was uh, I was feeling a bit intimidated about the prospects of that uh, transition in going from a uh, uh, mixed sex uh, primary school, relatively small, uh, into the uh, you know the tough single sex uh, school with uh, potentially a whole lot of really tough uh, uh, older uh, students. Uh, uh, but in fact, the transition was uh, pretty smooth. Uh, I remember being impressed by the immense uh, scale of uh, Yarra, even as it was in those uh, days and the, uh, uh, the formalities of the school uniform and this, uh, this cap uh, that we had to wear, uh, which was a bit of a new experience. Nevertheless, uh, I did what I was told and uh, wore the cap and uh, the uniform and all the rest of it. Uh, and getting the uh, doctor's red flannel uh, blazer, uh, all of that, quite gaudy, but uh, you know, it was a pretty snappy uh, uniform in those days. Uh, and um, immediately the, um, uh, the quality of the environment uh, impressed me. The, the, uh, uh, the, the buildings, uh, the, the classrooms, uh, the library in particular uh, was very impressive coming from a, a relatively modest sized school. Um, so that that was good. There was uh, a handful of my former classmates from primary, from the primary school, also in, in uh, year seven at the time, uh, and that's that helped smooth the transition because they provided an instant uh, peer group. Uh, but I think it didn't take. Uh, I remember it didn't take very long to establish uh, uh, a new peer group, a new friendship group uh, at the school. It, I don't remember there being any. Uh, difficulties with the transition uh, and the older kids uh, uh, seem to be uh, quite friendly and welcoming, not uh, the tough bruisers I imagine they would be from from uh, the primary school. Uh, so that was good. And the teachers also were uh, pretty uh, welcoming and uh, uh, eased the transition and uh, became quite um, uh, you know, uh, f- formative, uh, qu- quite um, important influences in, in the Yarra experience. You're quite right in in that notion of transition, and often we we sort of think that it's going to be 
much bigger, worse, wilder, crazier, harder than what it actually turns out to be. And, and I mean, I, I think most of us can recall that transition from primary school into secondary school and, and the, you know, I guess the fear, the anticipation, the nervousness around that. But it's wonderful to hear that uh, that was a, a relatively smooth transition and there were some friendly uh, faces when you got to the school. I wonder, can you go back to, do you remember going on a camp in those early days, whether it be a year seven or year eight? Did you spend time away from the school? No, so there weren't, I think the camp program uh, was still uh, in its uh, embryonic phase uh, when I started and we didn't really go on a camp until uh, the senior years. Um, I remember uh, going to Wooten Lodge uh, for the, the German camp organised by uh, Ozzy Groylich. Um, I guess that was year, maybe that was year 10 or year 11. And, uh, and then later we had a, an adventure camp um, uh, involving, uh, uh, again, to Wooten Lodge and, and a hike in, uh, staying overnight in the, in the mountains uh, and some other interesting experiences involving chickens and uh, cooking them ourselves. Uh, so that was, uh, that was much later, year 11 and 12, I think. Maybe sure. More. Yeah. But they, they were good. They were good fun. And particularly the German camp because uh, Mr. Groylich organised for a, a, another school to join us, uh, a girls' school, uh, so who also uh, had a, a big German class. And so we had this experience of trying to maintain uh, just speaking German for the duration. But, of course, as soon as we were out of earshot, uh, a little bit of English uh, slipped, uh, slipped in there. In fact, I, I wish now I'd uh, 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 study German more conscientiously. I did study it conscientiously at the time um, uh, and only gave it up in year 12 because I never imagined that in my future career uh, I would be spending time in Germany, Germany and need to use this uh, language. And uh, I now ha have had very close uh, research connections with colleagues in Germany for the last two decades and uh, have been to Germany almost once a year uh, ever since. So uh, I've had plenty of occasion and I can, I can say that uh, Mr. Broilich implanted that German very deep and it all sort of comes back gradually when you need to on the streets of, uh, of Germany. So I, I appreciate that. It, it is interesting, isn't it, that when you're in the thick of it, uh, an experience like learning a language can be a really tough grind and really hard work, and uh, and and it's easy to go, ah, when is this actually going to be relevant? But I well, dare, dare. We've got to remember in the in the 1970s, uh, the cost of overseas travel was astronomical, and I never imagined that I would travel overseas because the cost was uh, out of sight and. Um, uh, that uh, proved to be uh, a wrong assumption. Uh, the price, of course, came down and uh, I eventually became a student backpacker in Europe uh, on, on uh, very uh, tight resources uh, and but had a terrific time. So, yeah, the, the benefits of that travel uh, have been immense in broadening my mind and uh, uh, getting the experience of different cultures and uh, getting by uh, using uh, the German and the French that I'd learned at, learned at school. So uh, really, really valuable experiences. And, and I'm very keen to unpack some of those experiences uh, in a moment because I know that worldwide travel has been part of your uh, journey through life to this point. Um, but before we leave school, I, I wonder generalizing whether there is a particular part of our school environment that you would have tended to find yourself you know was it out on the sports field did you love it in the drama hall were you up on the stage did you love being in the library were you out the back behind the shelter sheds having a smoke or you know where would we find you if we uh, stumbled across back in the 1970s where would we find David Jamison? Well, now there is a story. Um, so uh, in the middle years of the school, uh, you would find me in the bush, and that was a fabulous resource. Uh, I used to enjoy walking uh, in the bush at lunchtime. Um, but I developed a program in uh, rocketry, 
uh, and I, I'm sure this would be strictly forbidden in the 21st century, but uh, myself and a number of my uh, peers uh, used to build and launch uh, rockets uh, on the oval or uh, in the bush. Um, and indeed, uh, it got to the point where uh, many kids from the junior school uh, were interested in what we were doing. And I encouraged them to make their own, which we then fueled up and launched. Uh, so there were these little kids boarding the buses to come to school, carrying these rockets with fins and brightly painted nose cones and what have you that uh, caused a bit of commentary. And uh, I have to say, although it, um, uh, you know, this is a potentially quite a hazardous uh, activity, we were very careful. And uh, the teachers didn't shut it down. Uh, which was uh, very gratifying. I'm sure it would not be allowed today, but that was, uh, that's where I would have been uh, in answer to your question. But also in the library, the librarians um, uh, were very supportive of my interests and uh, recommended books, some of which I've still got on the list to read. I haven't quite got around to it yet, uh, but I've not forgotten uh, the recommendations. So uh, that was my first uh, encounter with the scientific uh, literature uh, in a formal sense. So the library subscribed to Scientific American, for example, a magazine, Popular Science magazine, and I have uh, subscribed to that magazine uh, ever since, even today, after all this time, I still have a subscription to that. And uh, that, that was also a very important uh, 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 resource provided by the school that broadened my horizons significantly, very uh, influential. And it wasn't just, I, I read um, every science fiction novel that was in the library, uh, but a, a lot of other books besides. So it was, uh, that was a really terrific resource. It, it's encouraging to me as one who uh, loves books and, and unpacks some of the truths in the books and the mystery and the imagination and, and wonderful things. But I also like you, and, and it's pleasing to hear that even you as an academic have books on your shelf that are not yet read, but uh, you'll get to them one day. Well, yeah, uh, I must say I've got a, a whole lot of uh, scientific textbooks which uh, uh, in my library, but I'm thinking more of the, the novels that the uh, – the librarian at the time recommended I read to broaden my uh, horizons. So I've still got in mind, I must finish reading that, uh, that those list of novels as soon as time is available. Yeah. Absolutely. It sounds like um, some of those, as you say, those, those exposure to some of those ideas and those thoughts and that, that thinking has actually inspired you into a particular field, a, bit, a particular course of study, and and science sounds like it was something that uh, really grabbed your imagination really quite early on. Well, Paul, I, I've uh, been interested in science uh, for as long as I can remember, uh, even at uh, primary school and from the earliest times. Uh, so I already came to the school um, with a, a strong scientific interest. In fact, I think that was probably uh, an important factor in uh, my parents deciding to send me to uh, Tiara. Um, and uh, that was a good decision because the science program at Yarra was extremely strong, fantastic uh, classrooms and uh, excellent teachers, very well resourced, uh, the laboratories, the apparatus. Um, it was a very rich environment uh, for uh, uh, someone like myself interested in science. So, uh, yeah, that, that, was a, that was an interest I brought with me uh, to the school for my earliest years. What were the subjects you studied at Year 12? Can you remember? Yeah, I uh, did uh, a pure and applied maths, uh, physics, chemistry and uh, English. Fantastic. And... Do you recall you being satisfied with your results? Yeah, um, I um, I always had a very strong uh, uh, interest in uh, extracurricular um, activities. So, as I said before, my, a lot of my uh, expertise was uh, developed outside of the formal classroom environment. Um, I, I uh, did work uh, very hard in year 11 and 12. Um, and that, by the way, uh, if I may digress for a moment, that was a very different world um, 
in my uh, subsequent career, I've often uh, had to give talks on uh, education and science education in particular. And so I had occasion to look up um, what fraction of uh, my peers went on to year 12 in 1975. And it was only about 30%, I believe, of uh, uh, my peers did year 12. The rest went into the workforce at the end of year 11 or even earlier. And this was noticeable at uh, school because uh, the classes, when we transferred to year 11 and then to year 12, the classes became a lot smaller and a lot quieter and a lot more uh, conducive to learning, shall I say. Um, and of course, the world is very different today, uh, but there was not the same range of subjects on offer uh, back in 75 as there, there are today. So that, that was uh, a very uh, noticeable um, change in the environment as I progressed uh, through the year levels at school. So um, the, uh, thanks to the uh, excellent teaching I received at Yarra, I did, uh, did uh, well to, in uh, year 12 to uh, open up uh, many options for progressing to university and uh, I chose to study science at the University of Melbourne. So I made that transition in 1976 in the first year at the university. Fantastic. And, and so that, I'm, I'm delighted that you've taken us there because that's where I want to head to next. So you've done reasonably well studying some subjects that you uh, enjoyed and, and as you say, that, that often the co-curricular program uh, was what fueled some of your energies and some of your thinking and 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 perhaps added to some of your your own experience but you've then left Yarra and gone to university and what was that sort of journey like the transition again from you know you said from junior school or primary school to year seven was relatively smooth despite some apprehension about it how did it go from high school into the university uh, lifestyle how did you make that transition well, that, that was a really big jump uh, from school into the university because, uh, particularly at the University of Melbourne, because you're no longer a big fish in a small pond. Uh, with um, You are now uh, surrounded uh, by uh, the, uh, uh, the top students at all the other schools in uh, uh, Melbourne and beyond who, uh, where the students had come to the university. Uh, so you're a very small fish in an enormous ocean, <laughs> I would say. So it was, a, it was challenging to establish a peer group and um, uh, study uh, the advanced uh, subjects. So I got into the um, advanced physics program in uh, first year. Uh, so it was... Uh, it was a great experience to, to study that uh, program. And in fact, uh, one of my first um, lecturers in 1976 is still an important mentor uh, even today. And in fact, I've just got a message on my phone here that he wants to uh, see me about something on Monday. So uh, I need to make sure I'm there to talk to him. Uh, he's, he's a very, uh, very good guy, very interested in the uh, 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 activities of his former students, they, even from long ago, 1976, uh, uh, even though he's in his 80s now. But uh, I enjoy uh, talking to him about physics and about uh, the new discoveries we're making um, and uh, kicking around ideas over lunch uh, or uh, other, other, other occasions. Yeah, so, so that, that was um, those uh, three years of my bachelor's degree were uh, a challenge. Uh, but uh, I managed to to stay 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 on top uh, of the uh, studies, and uh, eventually progressed through into a PhD uh, after my uh, honours year, following the three years of the uh, Bachelor of Science, uh, uh, majoring in physics. So physics has captured you, and yeah. I dare say by the by you know a, a brief. Um, little bit of research that I may have been able to do, physics is still very much part of who you are and what you're about and what you speak and study and learn and, and I guess also want to um, share with others and, uh, and help others to um, capture some of that same fascination that you have. So if I may, 
as a professor of physics, uh, as a, a teacher, an educator, a studier, and a writer of physics, give us give us thirty seconds, a minute, five minutes, if that's what it takes, to allow the common folk, if I dare say, the the you know the mum and dad people who might be listening to this podcast who who don't are not kind of gripped by physics. What is it about physics that grabs you? Why why would we need to, should we learn more about physics? Well, it's going to take more than five minutes, Paul. Uh, this is a big topic, a very big topic. Uh, I, I, I should mention that uh, 1969 when I was in um, sixth grade, that was the year of the moon landings. And uh, that was everywhere. That was I was I followed that avidly uh, and uh, became even at primary school a bit of an authority uh, on the, uh, the physics, uh, such as it was that I understood in those days. Uh, and in fact, I still remember being sent home uh, with a group of uh, four or five of my uh, other pupils to watch the landings on television because not everyone had a television in those days. I mean, it's hard probably for your listeners to understand, but, uh, you know, uh, we had a roster. Those families who had televisions uh, hosted the people who didn't, and we watched the uh, Armstrong descend the ladder and walk on the moon, and I was just absolutely gripped. And I, uh, I still remember uh, my late mother uh, uh, taking me to the front door that evening and pointing to the moon that was rising over the trees and saying, you know, there are two men walking around on there right now. And it was, well, yeah, ah, the excitement and the fascination of how that was achieved and what they were discovering about the, uh, you know, the origin of the moon and all the rest of it was just so exciting. Um, so that was, that was, that uh, pushed me along down that pathway. Um, and, you know, I was, at, at, at Yarra, I was interested in all uh, sorts of science, not just physics, uh, chemistry as well. Uh, and I kept those options open when I moved to the university. Um, but in the end, uh, physics was what, where my main interests lay. But uh, along with that interest in making my own contribution to the uh, body of knowledge about physics uh, in, through my research career, uh, I've always had a, a strong stream of outreach and explaining uh, physics uh, to anyone who will listen. And so for the last 30 years, I've been running uh, the July Lectures in Physics, and all the listeners are very welcome to come along uh, to this program uh, each Friday in July, uh, where we uh, give uh, four or sometimes five lectures on uh, fundamental issues in physics. So that's always been a great pleasure to uh, dream up a topic. Uh, and uh, of late, we've been getting large crowds turn up for these lectures. We've got a huge uh, library of um, physics demonstration apparatus that we wheel into the lecture theatre to uh, illustrate the lectures uh, with uh, all sorts of exciting uh, uh, experiments that we do on site, including uh, some one of my colleagues brought in antimatter and we annihilated antimatter in the lecture theatre, so you just don't see that in an ordinary lecture, you know. Yeah, you've got to come along to the physics lectures to see that sort of stuff. Uh, but also, you know, my interest in astronomy and uh, uh, the fundamentals of physics, quantum mechanics, Einstein's contribution, Galileo, all of those things have uh, been part of my uh, public lecture program. And, and the material that I generate for those public lectures also finds its way back into my undergraduate lectures that I, that I um, is the other half of my career, the teaching part of my teaching and research uh, position I hold today. So yeah, the, the pleasures of explaining uh, physics to an interested audience uh, has been uh, an important uh, part of my uh, career. Fantastic. And, and your career has also taken you uh, beyond the shores of Australia, hasn't it? Was that in pursuit of study or was that in, in various roles that you had when you travelled, I think, the US and the UK? You've you've had some roles in those places. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, all, all of that. I mean, physics, uh, the human endeavour of physics is uh, transnational. It, it doesn't belong to any particular nation. Uh, the physics is out there and uh, everybody participates in uh 
uh, uh, uncovering it. In fact, uh, it was remarkable a few years ago I visited uh, CERN, the European uh, uh, Particle Physics Lab in, uh, in uh, Geneva. Uh, that's where they discovered the Higgs boson. They've got this 28 kilometre circumference particle accelerator buried under the ground there with these gigantic detectors and they collide beams of protons and create new particles. Um, and uh, after a tour of the facilities, we went into the cafeteria for lunch and it was just astounding to see the, th the thousand physicists who worked there sitting down having lunch. It was deafening, a cacophony of sound. But the, the multiracial mix was just astounding. There were, there were people from every uh, human uh, variety uh, in, in there having lunch, talking to each other, uh, guys in turbans, women in headscarves, uh, very pale looking people, uh, people are very dark looking people, uh, all over the place, uh, all united by this great quest to uncover the frontiers of physics. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Every different cultures, different religious backgrounds, different dietary requirements. You should have seen the food on offer necessarily in an international institution like that, but they were all, we were all united in the, in the quest to push back the frontiers of physics and understand more deeply about the way the universe works. It was a wonderful thing to see. And that's, that's uh, an important aspect of physics. So I don't, you know, we've been multicultural from the year dot, you know, that's not a new thing for physics. But um, my career, when I finished my PhD, I took a job at uh, the California Institute of Technology in uh, the United States in Pasadena, one of the suburbs of Los Angeles, uh, and lived there, uh, lived there in the uh, Los Angeles basin for a couple of years, uh, working at Caltech doing uh, some fundamental uh, material science research in a group, um, well-established group there, learning new skills, um, uh, working with um, the material science of semiconductor materials for advanced uh, devices. Uh, and that uh, was an excellent platform then for a career move to the University of Oxford in the UK. Uh, quite a contrast in styles, I should say, from the sort of freebooting uh, Californian approach uh, to life in the warm sunshine to a more sort of English conservative uh, uh, approach in the somewhat dismal weather conditions of uh, Oxford, but, uh, very different to uh, Pasadena, I must say. Uh, but still uh, taught me a lot. I uh, got to work with a lot of inspiring people who uh, taught me things uh, that I brought back eventually to Australia when I returned uh, with my wife and son uh, in 1989. We've been based in Australia ever since. Ever since. But um, my uh, interests have, uh, have taken me uh, every year, take me overseas. Um, in various roles, uh, often to speak at uh, conferences or uh, to give seminars to people who are interested in my work. They very kindly invite me to come and speak or to uh, uh, do other things. I, I uh, have a bit of a reputation for, uh, you know, giving after dinner speeches and what have you. So that's sort of a, a part of what I do these days. Uh, and last year I had the honour of uh, giving a talk at the opening of a new laboratory at the University of Manchester uh, that uh, is building on some of the work that we started a few years ago uh, and I gave a similar, uh, I've given similar talks elsewhere uh, around the world um, and in fact uh, one of the highlights of this uh, sort of work, my colleagues in uh, the University of Florence knew of my interests in uh, Galileo and a few years ago they organised with the National Library in Florence uh, for me to come and inspect uh, Galileo's laboratory notebooks uh, at first hand from uh, 1609 to 1613 and that was such a wonderful experience uh, to get that and that wouldn't have been possible without this, uh, all these connections through the uh, physicists of the world. So that, that was a, a you know, really formative experience to uh, be able to look at Galileo's actual notebooks from uh, the first time he, uh, a telescope was made and pointed to the stars 
and uh, changed the world. It was a wonderful thing. I think in in that that little moment there of the opportunity that you had, that has just captured the imagination of many of our listeners to say, wow, for you to actually be able to, and I dare say maybe not handle it, but at least. No, no, I I had, the, lo- the lo- they sat me down at this little desk and the chief librarian came in with this leather bound book under her arm and she put it down on the desk and opened it and then I could turn the pages uh, and look at it with my, with my own fingers. Uh, I've touched the pages that Galileo touched and looked at his writing. And I must say, uh, you know, I was looking for something in particular that I'd written about um, that attracted quite a bit of attention um, just uh, 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 as part of one of my public lectures that sort of had ripples that uh, eventually led me to uh, Florence. Uh, but the head of physics um, at the university had uh, organized, uh, facilitated this and he was uh, standing next to me at the uh, podium and he was a classical scholar as well as being a physicist. So he was able to be, to read the medieval Latin directly into English for my benefit. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was great. We were able to read what Galileo had written. Uh, and, you know, you could see the personality of the impatient uh, uh a great man in in the way there was so much slashing of the page with the quill pen of crossing things out, uncertain because of cloud, cross, cross, you know, and the pages were splattered with all sorts of stuff, probably last night's lasagna or something, you know, who knows? And you could very faintly smell wood smoke coming from the pages because no doubt he had a candle there on his desk as he was writing in his, his notebooks. So, yeah, really a direct, personal connection to Galileo was a fantastic thing. That's beautiful. I wonder, and, and maybe I'm being presumptuous, but I, let let me just unpack for a moment that idea of, of as you say, with the quill pen slashing through, I dare say, maybe some written thoughts or ideas or suggestions or or possibilities, and then he slashed it to say, no, that's not right. I don't I don't believe that anymore. I'm going to try something different. Is that that sense of... Um, uh, this was, these were his astronomical notebooks. So every night uh, for about uh, four years, he was out observing the sky and writing down in his notebook what he had seen. He drew little sketches. Uh, he was following the moons of Jupiter because uh, his telescope, the very first astronomical telescope that he made himself on hearing... Uh, about the invention of this instrument uh, used for uh, basically an opera glass or a fairground novelty. He figured out how to make one himself and uh, knew how to make really excellent lenses uh, so that it was good for looking at the sky. And for the, so for the first time, he, ter- he turned a telescope to the sky. And when he, when he looked at Jupiter through his telescope, he saw these four tiny stars that followed Jupiter around and they were clearly not part of the background and they changed position. And by carefully observing them and sketching them in his notebook, night after night after night, he realized these four tiny stars were actually orbiting Jupiter. And for us, hey, you know, no big deal because we've had 400 years to get used to this idea. But in those days, this was the first time something had been discovered that did not orbit the Earth, which was supposed to be the centre of the universe and everything was supposed to orbit the Earth. So this was a truly revolutionary discovery and and it was open for anyone to see who had a telescope. Um, You could see these objects orbiting a planet other than the Earth. Uh, So this was very troubling to to the accepted uh, view of the universe at the time. And of course, eventually all this got Galileo into a lot of trouble. But what I was looking for, if I can digress just for a moment, because it is an interesting story, um, he was a very conscientious observer. And as he was tracking uh, Jupiter across the sky night after night as it it moved uh, against the backdrop of the stars, Occasionally, a star, a real star, would wander past the field of view. It's actually a bit of moving, but it moved against the backdrop of the star. So he labelled these stars that appeared nearby from time to time. And uh, in uh, the uh, 
1612, he labelled uh, a star uh, in his notebook uh, near Jupiter on that particular night uh, that doesn't appear in any star catalogue. Uh, uh, very mysterious. How? To, what was this star that he labelled in his notebook? Well, it turns out it wasn't a star after all. It was the planet Neptune. So for the first time since deep antiquity, human a human had discovered a new planet. Uh, now, I wanted to see if there was any evidence that he knew that this star was not a star, but instead a planet, because a few weeks later, he saw it again, next to a real star, and he labelled them both fixer in his uh, notebook, meaning fixed star. But uh, over, over two successive nights, uh, the star that was... Neptune moved away from the real star, the, the gap between the two stars widened. And this can only happen if it's a planet, a wandering star after that. That's what a planet means. And so he wrote in his notebook, oh, uh, star B appeared to move further away from star A, or words to that effect. And, you know, he was a very smart guy and he must have realised, oh, a star that moves, that's a planet. And who would you tell? <laughs> Who would you tell? Uh, he was already, you know, treading pretty close to the edge uh, and to suddenly announce a new planet. Uh, maybe, maybe he thought that, and he never did, he never did. Uh, but I'm wondering whether he encoded some secret code in his notebook uh, just to record his idea at the time that he could later reveal that, oh yeah, I saw that in uh, 1612. Here's my notebook, here's my entry. Because he knew that uh, you had to publish or you would perish. He knew that, that he, to be first was most important and he protected his discoveries by using these secret codes, uh, as is well known. Um, so, I, I, But I couldn't find it. So I'm not sure whether he decided he, he, he should follow that up. But you can't see Neptune with the unaided eye. You can only see it through a telescope. And after it moved away from... Uh, Jupiter, you'd never be able to find it again, technology in the 17th century. So, sadly, I was unable to pro uh, provide any evidence that uh, Galileo knew he'd discovered a new planet. But I'm still looking. There are other notebooks still to be searched. I, I was going to say, it, it may be that there is evidence there somewhere, you just haven't discovered it yet. No, no I have to keep looking. I suspect yes. there was a letter he sent to Johannes Kepler that uh, may have had a code... Uh, the secret code, because there were other letters that he wrote that did have codes about uh, the phases of Venus and uh, the rings of uh, Saturn. So I'm sure there might be one for this as well, but it hasn't come to light. It's fascinating stuff. We're, well, I'm thoroughly enjoying a, a conversation with Professor David Jamison from the class of 1975. David, we're, we're uh, just about out of time, but I wonder, there's, there's one key question I, I want to ask you, and that is, if you were to sit down at lunch with a thousand people in the room of all nationalities and all backgrounds and religious perspectives and all of that, like you mentioned, that you were uh, privileged to be am amongst the cacophony of conversations and discussion, if you were in that space today and there were four or five people around you who could hear at your lunch table and they're from all different parts of the world, maybe some... Uh, from downtown Ringwood near Yarra Valley Grammar. What are some things that you would be talking about in the world of physics? What, what's really lighting you up at the moment? Okay, so um, my present research program is uh, aimed at uh, making devices in which a single atom is the functional component. So we want to try and take a block of uh, silicon, very pure silicon, the same material used for Pentium chips uh, and, the, and the information technology industry. And we are inserting just one foreign atom into this block of silicon, wiring it up to control electrodes and programming information into the quantum states of this atom. So this is... Uh, the new field of quantum technology where we're trying to use fundamental quantum mechanical principles uh, for new ways of encoding and processing and transmitting information that'll give us capabilities 
that are beyond the capacity of our classical uh, computers at the moment. So, uh, for example, uh, as long ago as the 1930s, the great uh, theoretical physicist Paul Dirac said that basically all uh, the physics of chemistry uh, is, is known, uh, but we can't calculate uh, uh, chemistry, can't calculate the results of chemical reactions because it, it, the equations are too difficult for us to handle, even though we know the physics. There's just too many bits and pieces that have to be uh, take, kept, in, kept track of in order to predict the outcome of chemical reactions, for example. And gradually, gradually over the, the, the following years, uh, computers got become more powerful, supercomputers came into existence, and gradually we started being able to predict the results of chemical reactions. But because the, it's so complicated, nature is so complicated, our, even our best classical computers, our present computers, will never be able to uh, predict the results of uh, atoms and uh, uh, molecules um, useful for life, for example. An antibiotic, really important molecule for treating disease, but we're reduced to having to do experiments with test tubes and grinding up mould or starfish or whatever, looking for new molecules that could be new antibiotics. And this is a major problem in the world today as the old antibiotics begin to be ineffective as um, uh, evolution uh, uh, develops resistance. But if we could use physics, we could design new molecules from first principles and not have to resort to all this complication with test tubes and what have you. And that's, that's like a, a, a fantastic dream. But with quantum computers, uh, we may one day be able to uh, design new bad antibiotics from the ground up. We could reverse engineer the bacteria that we want to deal with, with the synchrotron understand its uh, molecular structure and then design a molecule from first principle uh, that could uh, uh, act as an antibiotic against that molecule. So this is an intoxicating possibility of advancing technology way beyond what's possible uh, with classical machines today, with the new type of quantum machine, where we engineer quantum mechanics into the machine to do useful functions. And so that's, that's what I'm working on at the moment. It's a really uh, exciting vision and uh, shared by uh, many people around the world. Uh, I gave a speech on this in uh, Vienna uh, uh, late last year uh, to uh, talk about the potential of this new technology and the, and the new engineering techniques we're going to need and are developing to make it a reality. I, I, I'm fascinated with the concept and, and your you're living it, that you tap into the past, you learn from history and you process it yourself with your own experience, expertise, research, and now you're looking to the future to say, right, what's next? What else can we discover? What else can we create? What else can we kind of imagine? It's an extraordinary uh, journey that you're on and uh, it's, it, it is, dare I say, quite the inspiration. Thank you for your work. Well, Paul, thank you very much for your interest and uh, for your time today. It's been uh, great fun. Professor David Jamison from the class of 1975, you have been inspired by Yarra because it all started back then and you had the uh, opportunity to explore and, uh, you know, send rockets up and uh, influence younger children to do the same. And, and perhaps that was the seed of an idea that has led to um, many, many papers, much research, and by the sounds of it, around the world, inspiring others. So thank you for your contribution, not only to our school and our community, but indeed the wider um, international population as we continue to move forward in the world of physics and uh, see what might be possible. So thank you. No worries. All the best. Well, that wraps up another episode of Inspired by Yarra. And I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Oh, look, I've got to admit, there were parts of uh, the conversation that I didn't fully understand all of what Professor Jamison was talking about. But equally, there were times when I got goosebumps when he was talking about being able to sit down with 
the actual journal and turn the pages. A real sense of discovery and a real sense of looking into the past to help thrust us into the future. And that is important work. So we salute Professor David Jamison and his colleagues in their pursuit of, well, really uncovering and unpacking and finding and discovering and creating a world that we will come to know and expect and accept as familiar. Yogs, they're a fascinating crew and they've got each a story to tell. And I hope you enjoyed listening and hearing part of David Jamison's story. If you are indeed a yog or you know a yog, then we'd encourage you to uh, either share this with other yogs, stay in touch with us via the www.yvg.vic.edu.au slash community section on our website. Maybe you know of a yog and you could suggest a name If they might be somebody who you think would be uh, great to have on the podcast, then we'd love to hear about that as well. I hope you'll join us next episode when we'll sit down again with another Yog to see how they too have been inspired by Yarra. My name's Paul Joy, and on behalf of everyone here at Yarra, especially those who are part of the team who put this podcast together, I want to wish you another day of inspiration where you go out there with intentionality to make a positive impact in the world around you.